Hey, what's going on, Rattlers? So here in Arizona, one of the biggest and most awesome lizards that you can see just sunning themselves on these rocks out here is the Chuckwalla. But listen, Chuckwallas really aren't that commonly kept. They're not really popular within our hobby. And I think the reason why is because a lot of people simply don't know how to properly care for them. So in this video, we're gonna look into how the Chuckwalla is living out here in the wild, but it's not just about the Chuckwalla. It's about any desert species that you guys may be keeping, including Euromastix, because their care and husbandry is very similar to the Chuckwalla's care and husbandry. So we're gonna walk around the mountains here in Arizona and see how the Chuckwalla and other desert lizards are living out here in the wild so that we better know how to care for them in our homes. I'm Dave Kaufman, and these are my reptile adventures. At Rainbow Mealworms, we grow all our insects 100% naturally so that you get the freshest, most lively feeders on the market. So for all your reptile food needs, place your order today at rainbowmealworms.net. Chuckwallas love it hot. As a matter of fact, they love it so hot they could probably survive on the surface of the sun. But if you look at this big male sunning himself, look at how black his body is. And that further absorbs more heat from the sun than the black rock that he's sitting on. These guys absolutely love it hot, and you have to keep that in mind when you're designing your enclosures for not only chuckwallas, but all desert species. All right, we're sneaking up on this little chuckwalla. When chuckwallas bask, they are always on guard. Baby chuckwallas are the perfect food for everything, for snakes, foxes, coyotes, even the adults will be eaten by coyotes and birds of prey. They are constantly aware of their surroundings, and it's really difficult to sneak up on a chuckwalla when they're out basking. They immediately retreat into the cracks in the rocks or under a giant rock, and they have a really unique defense mechanism when they retreat and that is to inflate their bodies with air and wedge themselves in that crack. So look at this little guy. This is a baby chuckwalla and this is probably only about a year old but even as I'm handling him he's puffing his belly out trying to wedge himself between my fingers. That defense mechanism that chuckies have man that is ingrained but just look at those really awesome subtle colors and if this is a male, he's gonna turn jet black with a bright orange tail as an adult. But I happen to think that this is a female, and if it is a female, then she is going to stay this brown coloration with those little black bars across her back. She's not going to get that black body and that really bright red tail that Chuckies have in this area of Phoenix. But this is what a little baby Chucky looks like. And you can see, why these guys would make a perfect meal for any lizard-eating snake out here or other predators. These guys are very vulnerable out here. But you can just look at that big fat belly puff out. And she's not fat. What she's done, again, is she's inflated herself with air because that is their only defense mechanism that they really have is to inflate themselves with air like that. Oh, uh, but he's getting a little agitated, so we're gonna let him go right back on the rock where he was. But man, you just got to admit that these guys are super adorable when they're babies. So this is the Chuckwalla's primary food source out here. This is a creosote bush. And if you look, there's really succulent leaves and flowers on these creosote bushes. And you can see down here, that's been stripped clean. And the branches out of the reach of the Chuckwalla are flourishing and flowering. But the creosote bush, is one of the oldest living things on the planet. Some of these in California have been carbon dated to over 2,000 years old. And this, again, is the Chuckwalla's primary food source. But a lot of people who would like to work with Chuckwallas simply can't get a steady supply of creosote shipped to them. And I think that's one of the deterrents for people not really working with chuckwallas. However, in our domestic situation, they don't need to just eat creosote. And on that note, one of the most talented chuckwalla breeders I know 
doesn't even live on this side of the world. It's Camille Hammers in the Netherlands, and if you guys recall, I did a video on his Euromastics, but he also keeps Chuck Wallas. So let's take a little trip back across the Atlantic to the Netherlands to see how Camille Hammers is caring for his Chuck Wallas and what he's getting them to eat over there. And so you you obviously work with a couple of other species here. I see, you know, uh, Chuck Wallas over here. Yeah, it's all it's all desert species. I like. Uh, I really like also the Chuck Wallas. The, those are the American. Uh, you're a messy. That's team. right. They just they need the same care. Um, they're really personable. The only thing they do is they make a mess of the windows. Yeah. With their snout. Wow. I really like those. So now you know a lot of people don't really keep Chuck Wallas in the United States, even though they're native to the United States, because you know a lot of people think that they need to eat creosote bush, you know, exclusively. What are you feeding your Chuck Wallas? Well, I I, exact, uh, I feed them exactly the same as the Euromastics. Um, the problem is, if I give them creosote bush now, I try it. I got it over from my friends in the United States and I try it. But when I feed it now, they don't want it because all the other greens I give them, they like more. Right, so they're acclimated it's, on this diet and yeah, that's they, the way to do that. It's, it's fresh, it's tastier. Um, they, they eat a lot of different greens, different herbs, and they really love flowers, all kinds of flowers. Yeah, I bred these guys this year. This year was uh, actually the second time, but the, uh, the first time was about eight to ten years ago I bred them. Um, now I, guess I just started over with them again uh, yeah. a few years, two years ago and uh, I bred them last year. This year? Um, this was the first time for my carrot tails. I got some uh, uh, red bags about every year now. Every year now, okay. Uh, last few years. That's great. But this is one of the red backs. This is one of the red backs, yes. So yeah, they are really calm, they're hand tame. I, I think you hit it right on the head. These are the American Euromastics. So while wild chuck wallas are in fact eating creosote bush almost exclusively out here in their natural habitat, there's a lot of varieties of commercially available diets that you can feed your chuck wallas in our domestic situations. All right, so the Chuckwalla shares its habitat with that guy right there. That is a desert iguana. So have a look at this, guys. This is the only species of iguana native to the US. Yes, there's green iguanas in Florida, but those are not native, they're invasive. This is a desert iguana, and just look at those colors on them. Look at those pinks and those browns. Man, these are little strips of lightning out here. These are sun-loving lizards, just like the Chuckwallas. And when you see them, man, they're gone. But this one, well, I was a little bit faster than he was. But this guy, like the Chuck Walla, is using the exact same habitat and is out at the exact same temperatures as Chuck Walla's. So if you're keeping desert iguanas, you basically keep them exactly the same way you would Chuck Walla's or Euromastics. Now these guys can be omnivorous, which means that they eat insects, meat, and plants as well. All right guys, so this guy was kind enough to let me catch him and I'm going to put him back exactly where he was to let him get back to foraging on this creosote bush over here. But man, aside from the Chuckies, these are one of the coolest lizards that you can find down here in the Sonoran Desert in Arizona. All right, little guy, go back to Arizona. Um, really? You're gonna, you're gonna let me catch you again? <laughs> <laughs> okay, little guy, if you see like something coming down with big feathery wings, you gotta run. You gotta run from predators. Here, let's try this again. Yeah, there's your little hole. Go on. Are you really? So in the Chuck Wallace habitat here, if you're not a geologist, there are basically two types of rocks. There's light rocks and there's dark rocks. And these lizards are so heat loving 
that they're not really sitting on the light rocks that are reflecting that heat off. They're actually sitting on the darker rocks that are much hotter. So when it comes to the temperatures in your enclosures at home, let's take some temperature readings out here to see just how hot these chuckwallas are thriving in. So on this rock where a chuckwalla would probably be basking, look at that, the temperature is 126 degrees Fahrenheit which is 52 degrees Celsius. So that is what the temperatures in your enclosure should be on the basking site, but the ambient temperature is gonna be a lot cooler than the surface temperature. All right, so for the ambient temperature, let's take an ambient reading. It's 34 degrees Celsius, which is 93 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is the ambient temperature out here in the desert. And these guys are out basking in this all day long. So one of the things that is often overlooked when keeping desert species is UV light. So here on this rock where any desert reptile would be basking right now in midday in the heat of the day, this is what the UV index reads. That's a staggering 9.2, 9.3, 9.1. That is really high UV index. And therefore, I think that a lot of people that are keeping desert animals are not providing them with a strong enough UV bulb. And getting that UV to be that high in your enclosure is something that is so often overlooked or done incorrectly, but it is just as important as the temperatures that you keep your desert dwelling reptiles in. So these are two UVB lights here. Yeah, they're next to each other. That, uh, that is to give the animal a larger uh, range of UVB. One is a 70 watt UVB and the other one is a 35 watt UVB. So they got different uh, strengths of UVB and you got a bigger spot that has UVB for the lizard. And again, UV light is so often misunderstood and therefore I think a lot of people are keeping these desert reptiles at a too low of UV index and therefore they are not thriving in our enclosures. And that could also explain why a lot of people just don't work with chuckwallas. But those temperature readings and those UV light readings don't just apply to chuckwallas. They apply to any desert reptile that you guys are keeping. All right, so joining me today on this Chuck Walla expedition is Kelly Paul. You may remember Kelly from our last video that we shot together on your iguanas, but while I was there, you showed me off your Angel Island Chuck Wallas and the Chuck Wallas that you're working with. And well, I figured if we're doing a Chuck Walla video, you're the guy to talk to about captive care, feeding and breeding. Well, I'll do my best. Um, I've had the Angel Island Chucks probably for over 20 years at this point in time. Um, as far as care, I keep them outside year round. I know the islands don't get as cold as it does here in Phoenix. So I put cane heat pads in there in a wreaths stack, which is basically plywood with little spaces in between it. And they kind of thermal regulate in there. And when the temperatures drop below 50, I turn that heat pad, heat mat on. And I've checked it periodically, even when we get down to about 30 degrees, the temperature on the heat pad itself is about 60 to 65 and the temperature within the hide space is roughly 55. Um, so that seems to work. As far as food, I feed them a lot of dandelion flowers. I've collected creosote while it's in bloom and fed them to them. I've tried to replicate what 
our chucks eat. Um, I also come out and get a lot of mallow, wild mustard, all that while it's in season. And then uh, from my other video, I grow a lot of my own food too, mustard greens, collards, romaine, different colors of romaine. I also uh, use hibiscus flowers, tacoma flowers, just kind of anything. Unfortunately, I have not had a lot of success breeding them. I've tried letting them lay outside. I've tried letting them lay inside. Uh, but my success is abysmal, but that's okay because it's fun. They're enjoyable little chucks and it keeps me, uh, keeps me trying. And for lack of a better word, they are just uh, pudgy and adorable as babies. So I look, yes, forward, to, I look forward to having them again Fantastic. whenever I can. All right, so as far as people that don't live in Arizona, people from Minnesota, New York, Canada, wherever they may live that want to keep chuck wallas oh. that don't have access to, you know, the vegetation that they would normally eat out there, what would you suggest for them? You know, I would probably hope that your market has uh, dandelion greens, just, just something, you know, obviously I think at this point in time, everybody knows that regular head lettuce is no good. It's just all water right. content. But I would also maybe supplement a little head lettuce if you're keeping them in a hot, dry enclosure, not often, but just maybe to take care of their moisture needs. But at a very minimum, some of the red romains, maybe some of the green romains. And like I said, there's gotta be turnip greens. There's gotta be collard greens, mustard greens. There's gotta be stuff that you can find at your market. So as far as like some of the more commercially available diets for like Euromastics, the little pellets, would you suggest those for Chuck Wallace? You know, I would. It's something that I never considered. Um, I'm kind of old school. It's, it's. I don't know why I haven't tried that, but I would, I would definitely try that. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Well, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but there's a Chuck Walla right above us as we're filming this. Uh, these guys are actually rather common around here. Sometimes you come out here, you don't see any. Uh, that is true. I when I come with my hiking buddies, they just tell me to trudge. I don't have a lot of time to look around, so I was rather dubious about finding some right. of this trip, and I'm just glad we did. Yeah. So guys, I hope that this video shed some light on how to properly care for desert species, including chuck wallas. You know, they are really awesome lizards, and I think that if more people knew how to better care for them, they would be much more popular within our hobby. So guys, as always, thanks for watching, and be sure to check out my sponsor's links that are in the description below. And until the next reptile adventure, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle on.